Hello, welcome to Cardio Flash College, a place to learn cardiology with flash animations. Today we have a very special video, as it is the last video of this year. So get ready because today we will review everything you need to know about the clinical management of coronary perforations. Join us! As you know, coronary perforations are a rare complication of percutaneous coronary intervention. However, they are associated with an increase in adverse cardiovascular events during follow-up, including, as you can imagine, cardiac tamponade, hemodynamic compromise, and death. Thus, coronary perforations can be classified according to the location or the severity of the complication. In this way, coronary perforations can occur in main or large vessels, in distal beds, or in branches of collateral circulation, both septal and epicardial. All this having prognostic and therapeutic implications. In this manner, the most frequent causes of large vessel perforation are overexpansion of coronary balloons or stents, aggressive modification of a thromatous plaque, and rupture of inflated balloons. For its part, the most frequent cause of perforation of distal coronary beds is distal and uncontrolled migration of the angioplasty guide wire, especially if they are covered with polymeric jackets. And finally, the perforation of collateral branches is traditionally associated with retrograde angioplasty techniques on chronic coronary occlusions. Regarding the severity of the perforation, these complications can be classified into three different ways according to the Ellis classification. Type 1 perforations are those that present an extraluminal crater without extravasation of contrast. Type 2 have myocardial or pericardial blush with an exit hole of less than 1 mm and type 3 have frank extravasation of contrast into another cavity through an exit hole greater than 1 mm in diameter. For all these reasons, it is logical to assume that the clinical impact of coronary perforations is directly related to the ability of operators to identify and adequately treat these complications. That being said, let's take a look at the following therapeutic algorithm. Let's start with the basics. First thing to do after identifying a coronary perforation, regardless of its location or severity, is to inflate an angioplasty balloon proximal to the lesion, guaranteeing a one-to-one -one relationship with respect to the diameter of the vessel and maintaining an inflation pressure of 8 atmospheres for intervals of approximately 5 to 10 minutes. In addition, it may be necessary to ask for help from the rest of the heart team, since an immediate clinical evaluation and urgent echocardiography can help confirm or rule out both pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. Thus, in the case of cardiac tamponade, the priority should be urgent pericardiocentesis, accompanied or not by a blood transfusion or reinfusion of the extracted pericardial fluid. If hemodynamic instability persists, it may be necessary to administer vasoactive amines or use circulatory support devices. Finally, it is recommended to have the support of anesthetists and cardiac surgeons since, in the worst case, emergent cardiac surgery may be necessary in order to repair the perforated coronary artery and drain the pericardial effusion. Going back to the algorithm, in many cases repeated balloon inflation may be more than enough to control the situation, but otherwise, if the bleeding persists, it will be necessary to implement specific measures to control coronary perforation. But what do these measures consist of? Very simple, we are talking about covered stents, coils, and other tools available for the percutaneous treatment of these complications. And as you can imagine, the use of each device is conditioned by the severity and location of the perforation. Great! Well then, let's start with the treatment of large coronary vessel perforations. If bleeding persists despite blocking balloon, the most recommended therapeutic strategy to seal perforation of large coronary vessels is the implantation of stents covered with a polytetrafluoroethylene, polyurethane, or pericardium membrane. Although the first devices had an unfavorable crossover profile, technology has progressed and we currently have more versatile devices, which has facilitated the procedure and obtained better clinical results during follow-up. In this way, covered stents are specially recommended for the treatment of coronary perforations in vessels with a diameter of 2.5 mm or more and without important nearby collateral branches. In addition, the implantation of these devices must be carried out quickly, minimizing the time that elapses from the deflating of the blocking balloon until the covered stent is implanted. 
As you know, reducing deflation time is crucial to reduce pericardial bleeding and the potential development of cardiac tamponade. For this reason, there are some coronary intervention techniques that are frequently used in clinical practice in order to reduce the blocking balloon deflation time and with it, the bleeding time. The block and deliver technique is a technique that can be used with guide catheters of 8 French or more. This involves the introduction of a covered stent through the guide catheter that was used to navigate the blocking balloon. As the catheter lumen is wide enough, it is possible to keep the balloon inflated in the coronary artery while the covered stent is advanced through the catheter. This allows bleeding to be contained with the balloon practically until the last moment, that is, until the covered stent is ready to be implanted. For its part, the ping-pong technique, or double guide catheter, is the most recommended when working with six or seven French catheters. This technique involves introducing a second guide catheter through another vascular axis and then using this second catheter to advance an angioplastic guide wire and subsequently a covered stand through the perforated coronary artery. In this way, the ping-pong technique allows the blocking balloon to be kept inflated until the last moment that is, until the cover stand is ready to be implanted. Finally, regardless of the technique used, it is important to highlight that some authors may recommend the use of conventional stents when dedicated covered stents are not available. But this issue is controversial, since in some cases they could worsen the perforation. Very well, now let's see what we can do when perforation occurs in distal coronary beds. As you know, distal coronary bed perforations often occur in vessels with such a small diameter or such an inaccessible location that it is practically impossible to navigate and implant a covered stand at that level. For this reason, when the perforation occurs in a secondary branch, the implantation of a covered stand in the main vessel could be recommended in order to seal the ostium of that branch and with it the bleeding. However, it is better to consider other therapeutic alternatives in the case of heavily developed secondary branches, since local necrosis could be considerable. But what other alternatives are we talking about? Very simple, we are talking about distal coronary embolization techniques. This involves the introduction of hemostatic material in the perforation area by means of specific instruments, such as coronary microcatheters. The idea is to favor the formation of a local thrombus, thus interrupting the distal blood flow and, therefore, bleeding. The end result, as you can imagine, is the formation of granulomatous tissue around the embolized foreign body. Although any sterile microparticle can be embolized in order to seal the distal perforation, through this that there are certain materials used in a specially frequent manner for this purpose. So we better take a look. Let's start with microcoils. Microcoils are spiral metal filaments that have thrombogenic properties. These devices have a caliber that can range from 0.014 to 0.018 inches and are released in the area of interest by pushing them through a microcatheter. In some cases, these devices can be released through a controlled uncoupling mechanism, allowing more accurate results to be achieved. In any case, it is recommended to choose coils long enough to guarantee total occlusion in the lumen of the perforated vessel. Autologous biological tissues Distal coronary embolization of blood clots, or the patient's own fatty tissue, has been carried out for many years, as these tissues are biocompatible and available in any case, so they are a useful therapeutic alternative when coils or other sealing materials are not available. When the operator decides to use blood, it is recommended to place it in a sterile container and wait for it to clot. For its part, when it is decided to use fat, it is recommended to chop it into very small pieces with the help of a scalpel. After having properly prepared the material, it is recommended to soak the samples with a contrast medium, otherwise the operator would not be able to see these tissues during their release. Finally, the embolization of the material is carried out through a microcatheter, pushing these tissues with the help of a wire or injecting contrast with a syringe. Other devices. As you know, thrombin is an enzyme that stimulates fibrin formation, and for this reason, thrombin is available in the form of solutions or gels 
that can be embolized through microcatheters in order to seal coronary perforations in distal beds. All the devices are microspheres. These are spherical, hydrophilic, non-absorbable particles of variable size which can be administered through a microcatheter in order to seal distal perforations similar to coronary coils. Finally, some authors have described distal embolization techniques using fragments cut from angioplast balloon, collagen fragments obtained from percutaneous femoral closure devices, or even some recommend embolization of pieces of skin. In any case, the main advantage of distal embolization techniques over covered stand implantation is that the blocking balloon used to contain bleeding can remain inflated while embolization of the chosen material is carried out through the microcatheter. Fantastic, because now we only have to talk about the perforations that occurred in the collateral circulation vessel. As you know, this is a characteristic complication of the retrograde approach of chronic total coronary occlusions. In general, many of the aforementioned sealing techniques can be used, but taking into account that, unlike the previous cases, sealing must be performed simultaneously, both through the anterograde and retrograde approaches. Finally, if the previously mentioned universal and specific measures fail and bleeding persists, we should consider removing the angioplasty material and administering intravenous protamine at a dose of 1 mg for every 100 units of heparin administered, since the idea is to achieve an activated clotting time less than 150. In addition, fresh frozen plasma can be useful in many cases, especially if the patient has previously been anticoagulated with bivalirudin. Either way, the idea is to correct clotting times in order to contain bleeding and, at the same time, leave the patient ready for emergent cardiac surgery if necessary. Great! As you have seen, the work algorithm practically summarizes a set of therapeutic strategies that are really useful in the percutaneous treatment of coronary perforations. For this reason, if you want more detailed information about it, we recommend that you take a look at the review that the authors have done on the subject. Without anything else to add, this has been all for today at Cardio Flash College. We hope you liked the video. If so, subscribe to the channel and leave a like. We'll see you in the next class. And remember, don't come late. Bye.